I want to welcome all of our virtual members of Columbine United Church across the nation and around the world this morning. Whether you are visiting us through a podcast or watching us on YouTube, we are very thankful that you are with us, and we have a treat for you this morning. As I mentioned, we are stumbling into the territory of immigration. Steve, in his infinite wisdom, has assigned this topic to me. Whew, I will have to get him back for this one. <laughs> this sermon today is not political. It will affect your politics, but it's not political. This issue transcends our day-to-day -day politics. This is an issue that's about people and how we treat people and how we orient ourselves towards other people. And you will see very quickly with the Scripture text today that the Scripture has a bias. And I share that Scripture's bias with you. Two Scriptures today. One's from Matthew 25. It's a Scripture that you will no doubt have heard before. The second one is from Leviticus. Now, you're in a special treat this morning. Columbine United Church rarely uses Leviticus. <laughs> so... You're in for it. You are in for it today. Starting in Matthew chapter 25, then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison or come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Then he'll turn to the goats, the ones on his left. Sorry, you guys get my left when I, when I read scriptures like this. You're not goats. You're good. You're good. You might be. Hmm. The ones on his left and say, get out, worthless goats. You're good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, and you gave me no bed. I was shivering, and you gave me no clothes. Sick and in prison, and you never visited. Then those goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison? And didn't help. He will then answer them. I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you failed to do one of these things to someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. Then those goats will be herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. And then a scripture text from Leviticus. When a foreigner lives with you in your land, don't take advantage of him. Treat the foreigner the same as a native. Love him like one of your own. Remember that you too were once foreigners in Egypt. I am God, your God. And there, our scripture text ends. Let's consider how we'll apply these words to our lives this morning. Immigration, fear, hospitality, and the least of these. We are diving in, going deeper in this sermon series for the past few weeks. We started with Pride Sunday and talking about LGBT rights and celebration. Last week, Steve took you deep into homelessness. And today, I take you in to immigration. Immigration. Immigration is not just an issue of today. It's always been an issue in every time, in every place, in every group, in every tribe, in every city, in every nation, with all people. We tend to think as Americans living in the 21st century, when we hear the word immigration, we tend to think of our southern border. Immigration is so much larger than that. Immigration can be by choice. It can also be forced upon people. It can be something that is an opportunity. It can also be the worst thing to ever happen to somebody. The journey can be great. 
the journey can be end with destruction and death and disease. Immigration is complicated. And the scriptures speak to the concept, the idea of immigration over 60 times throughout scripture, specifically. Let alone all the Bible passages like Matthew that you can indirectly apply to it. Over and over and over again, our Bible addresses the issues of immigration and how we treat people who are migrating to us, through us, and away from us all of the time. The Scriptures, as I mentioned, have a bias. I share that bias. That bias is towards compassion and grace and mercy and hospitality, and love. And that is the bias I will share with you this morning. No matter what your politic is, no matter what you think of what is going on on our border right now, whatever you think about what's going on around the world today, if your start, if your beginning on this issue does not start in compassion and grace, then you have no business talking about this subject at all. And that is where the Scripture stands. That's what our faith tradition stands. And that's where Steve and I stand on this topic. In our country today, all of us in this room are immigrants or descended from immigrants. Each and every single one of us or our ancestors were strangers at some point in this land. We were foreign to it. We were alien to it. Each and every one of our ancestors at some point found themselves to be outsiders, some more than others. Our motto here at Columbine United Church for a very long time has been a place where faith and life meet. I'll tell you what, when it comes to the subject of immigration, there is no better place where faith and life meet. It is an intersection that cannot be avoided as people of faith. And our ideas, our thoughts have to be driven by our faith on it. This Matthew text that we read is the famous passage where Jesus tells a parable of a king who separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep are unaware of why they're sheep. The goats are unaware of why they're goats. The sheep have somehow treated the king the way the king wanted to be treated. And they don't know how they did that because they didn't see the king hungry or thirsty or cold or shivering or as a prisoner or as a stranger. The goats didn't see the king ever in those situations. The goats didn't see someone who was hungry. The goats didn't see someone who was oppressed. The goats didn't see someone who was ignored. But in both cases, Jesus says that the king looks at both of them and says, when you see that person who's in poverty, when you see that person who's in the worst of times, when you see that person who's in prison, when you see that stranger, when you see that person who's hungry, when you see that person who needs healing, when you see that person out there, that was me. And you as sheep, you gave them something to drink. You visited them in their prison cell. You gave them attention. You reached out and touched them. But you goats, at the best, you ignored them. At the worst, you persecuted them and derided them and kept back the food and kept back the water and kept back the visits, kept back the clothing. And you did not know it. You did not know that every time you do that, it was for the king. In Christian theology, a long thread has been woven throughout history It keeps coming back around, around, and around. It tells us this. God has a preferential option in treatment for the poor, for the oppressed, 
for the least of these, for the ignored, for the people who are at the worst moments of their life, and especially for those who are at those worst, worst moments because of other people. Jesus spent his entire ministry with people who were on the margins of society. Every time I come to the four Gospels and I read through them, I am painfully aware that Jesus spent 99% of his time with people who are not like me. I am a white, male, middle-class, suburbanite, highly religious, highly educated, I am very aware of my place in this world, of my privilege in this world because of all of those things I just named. As a white person in this country, I am part of the majority. I am part of the power. I have privileges of that. I also have the shadow side of that. As a male, I get preferential treatment in this country by our culture, by our people. As a suburbanite middle class person, I have rights and privileges that a lot of other people in our own country do not have, not even speak of the rest of the world. As an educated person, I have doors open to me all of the time. As someone who's part of what is considered to be the religious elite, both of my day and Jesus' day, I have access to all sorts of different things. If today I wanted to, I could fly anywhere in the world. I might be poor in three days, but I could do that today. I have access to the entire world because of my privilege of all these different things, whether it should have been assigned to me or not. That is my part in life. Jesus did not spend time with people like me. And when he did, He said some really awful things to people like me. He had his harshest words of judgment for those who were in the ethnic majority, for those who were the educated, for those who were the religious powerhouses of the day, for those who had more than others. Whether they ignored those who were the least of these or actively did things to the least of these, Jesus had words of condemnation for people like me. God has a preferential option in treatment for those who are not like me. And every time I come to Scripture, I am very aware of it. And I carry that into every issue, into everything I encounter in the life, to go, God cares about those people And so must I. I must extend compassion because God extends compassion. I must extend grace because God extends grace. I must host other people because God always hosts other people, especially the least of these. And there's no denying that people who are in the middle of immigration— whether they're coming from Canada or coming through the borders of Mexico, whether coming across an ocean or living in the middle of a city as part of a particular group who've who've migrated years before, there's no denying that these people are often going through some really rough moments of life and that often people like me either pay no attention to them at the best, and at the worst, actively keep them at bay, actively take stuff away from them, actively, actively not giving them food, drink, comfort, shelter, clothes, etc., etc., as the parable says. Our denominations, I was surprised, are abundantly clear on this issue. Now, it didn't surprise me that the United Church of Christ is. They always tend to be abundantly clear about everything. But the Presbyterians tends, tend to hedge their bets on stuff. They tend to make up little, well, a little, a lot of paragraphs about stuff to kind of walk the line. 
And the Methodists, eh, depends on the day. <laughs> Let's be honest. Presbyterians talk a lot. The Methodists, eh, is it Monday or Tuesday? UCC, you always know exactly where they stand on stuff. But on this issue, each denomination is perfectly clear on what they think about immigration. And here's the reason why. This issue is not about the last five years in this country. This issue has been around for a very long time. And so it transcends our politics. It transcends the arguments going on in Congress and the White House right now. It transcends the crazy arguments on Fox and CNN and NBC and on the Internet and all those things. Because it goes to the heart of people and the heart of our faith. So let me read these to you. And these are just small paragraphs and the long long chunks of stuff that they say, but these capture the heart of the spirit of all their documents. Presbyterian Church USA, we are a people who believe that God migrated in the person of Jesus, who then became a refugee in Egypt. Beginning with Adam and Eve, the world's first immigrants, the Bible is replete with stories of our faith ancestors being called and sent to lands unknown. The story of our faith is told through the lens of immigration and immigrants, but we often miss the implication this has on our spiritual practices and faith tradition. The Methodist Church, they have a section called the Rights of Immigrants. We recognize, embrace, and affirm all persons, regardless of country of origin, as members of the family of God. We affirm the right of all persons to equal opportunities for employment, access to housing, health care, education, and freedom from social discrimination. We urge the church and society to recognize the gifts, contributions, and struggles of those who are immigrants and advocate, advocate for justice for all. And finally, the United Church of Christ. As Christians, we are called to love our neighbors, the Bible is unambiguous in calling us to welcome aliens and strangers in our land and to love them as we love ourselves. In these times, let us listen to the voice of the still-speaking God. We will learn how to respond to these new sisters and brothers residing among us. Immigration and the politics around it and the controversies around it have been around for a very long time. This was a very commonplace sign at a certain time in this country. You can replace Irish with just about any ethnic group or skin color. I bring up this sign because immigration goes beyond people crossing a border. Immigration, often at the roots of its controversies, has prejudice and fear and racism and hate and ignorance at its center and always has. Whether we're speaking of today or 50 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,500 years ago around the world, Immigration is an issue that is tainted with fear. Fear of the other. Fear of someone who doesn't look like me. Fear of someone who doesn't speak the same language as me. Fear of someone who doesn't dress the same way as me. Fear of someone who doesn't believe the same way as I believe. Fear. Fear. Why are we so afraid? Why are we so afraid when someone doesn't speak my language? Why are we so afraid when someone doesn't have my skin color? Why are we so afraid when someone doesn't dress like me? Why are we so afraid? There's always an unknown in all those factors. I don't know you. You don't know me. I don't know your culture. You don't know my culture. But you know what? God, in God's infinite wisdom, created this diversity of humanity. God celebrates our diversity, and so should we. 
when someone is different than us, rather than fear, it should be an opportunity. An opportunity to get to know God's other creatures other than myself. An opportunity for me to learn. An opportunity for me to be in friendship. An opportunity for me to be in collaboration. An opportunity for me to make the world a better place. But instead, we have signs like this that are rooted in fear. And that fear ultimately breeds hatred. And hatred will ultimately breed violence of some sort. Always, 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 in any discussion on immigration, somewhere this is present. Always. My Facebook feed has blown up in the past few weeks as the crisis on our southern border gets worse, as it gets covered more by the news media, as our politicians seem to squabble over more and more details of stuff. Everyone takes to Facebook, and they put their various opinions, whether conservative or liberal, progressive or ignorant, educated or not. Very few are, very few are overflowing with grace. Very few have love at its core. Very few are offering hospitality. This whole discussion is often rooted in fear. It's at its best, it's often rooted in, hey, let's take the best of those people crossing over and let's send the others away. Sometimes it's rooted in votes. But rarely is it really, truly rooted in God's grace and love and compassion. I hear no debates about how we can host these people while they are here, whether they go back home to their place or get to stay here. We don't hear a lot of discussions about how we are hosting at this moment. And I don't hear a lot of discussions about, for those who do get accepted in, how we are going to be kind to them how we are going to be there as a community for them, with them. Whether they're Mexican or Honduran or Guatemalan or Irish or African American, Chinese. Always, 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 throughout our history, fear and prejudice creep in and people become an issue, and people become a policy, and people become a process. And the individuals and their eyes and their smiles and their voices get drowned out. Xenophobia is real. Each one of us have a little bit of it. Some of us have a lot of it. Xenophobia, xeno meaning stranger, alien, foreigner, Phobia meaning fear. Fear of the stranger. Sometimes going as far as hatred of the stranger. Interestingly, xeno has another word in Latin and Greek, xena. And just by changing the O to an A, you go from stranger to host. From stranger to hospitality. It's the same coin, just two different sides of it. And in the Bible, when this word shows up, this zina, zin concept, they're always found side by side. In every scripture text that mentions a stranger, that mentions the alien, that mentions the foreigner, that mentions the migrant worker, that mentions the sojourner in the land, it's always talking about how do we host them? How do we see them as ourselves? How can we give them the same treatment that we give citizens, that people are, who are part of our groups? How can we show them kindness? How can we offer hospitality rather than fear? And as the Leviticus text ends, we do this. 
not only for all the various reasons I've already given, but for one really selfish reason. Because you too were once a stranger in the land of Egypt. Because you too, or your parents, or your grandparents, or their great-grandparents, were once too a stranger in the land. Were once too an immigrant. Were once too an outcast and an outsider. People feared you or feared your family. And so for all the wonderful reasons in the Bible for treating other people with love, the Bible gives us the selfish reason too. Because those people are in a situation that you have been in before. Gandhi said, the enemy of fear. The enemy is fear. We think it is hate. But it's fear. See, hate comes from ignorance. Hate comes from fear. Hate is not the root. It is fear. When I am afraid of somebody else, for whatever reason, that means I will not get to know them. I will not extend a hand to them. I will not look deeply in their eyes and see their humanity. I will deny it. I will deny getting to know them. And by not getting to know them, that allows me to make them a thing, an object, rather than a person. And then I can create a policy or a process that deals with them. Rather than walking up to somebody and going, how can I host you today? I love this picture. I debated whether to put it in there because it's kind of a, you know, I've already mentioned it, but I really liked it a lot. Who you call an immigrant? Pilgrim? Each and every single one of us are here from some other place. Even if you go far back enough, even the Native Americans came from Asia. We are all here as immigrants. We have all taken, been taken from some other place and came here. We must realize that. We must know that. We have two options. We can have fear, which we know where that leads. We can look throughout history and see where fear leads. Or we can have compassion and grace and hospitality. Now, it's a complex issue. I cannot tell you as a minister I am not educated enough nor smart enough to figure out what should happen on our borders today. I don't know if people should be sent back or be taken in. I don't know if walls should be built and fences brought up or should be torn down. I don't know if lines in the sand should be erased or should be made thicker. There are problems with each and every one of those things. But I do know that while people are among us, we must offer them love. We must offer them grace. We must be good hosts while they are with us, no matter what the policy is. We must look upon them as ourselves and offer them love because that's what God would do. And that's where we were at one time. Hope, dignity, welcome, compassion, hospitality, humanity. Let us pray. Dear God, we frame you so often as our eternal companion. And so it is. And it is time for the human mind, the human heart, the human spirit to understand its destiny of always belonging to you.
so long ago. Jesus was just present. And some people gathered around. And dear God, our eternal companion, there were moms, and there were dads, and there were children. And he called the children forward. And dear God, we know that he called all of them, not just some of them, called them all. And he blessed them. Sometimes the hardest journey we will take is to move from the head to the heart and learn how to welcome the ones we meet on the roads of life. Each precious to you. And so, as our eternal companion, help us to overcome the things in the head that build fences, that build walls, that make judgments that simply are not good. They're not graceful. They're not wholeness making and they're not healing. Now I face the darkness that is sometimes part of my own mind. And I know it's not easy. It's just necessary. And it's just possible. And so there's the model. We're to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And bring all of that as well to love of neighbor. Dear God, open our hearts and our minds to become a hospitable people. And to care and to think that the next person that I look in the eye, the next person I stand near, the next person I shake hands with is an immigrant. But not to you. And in the wisdom of our Christ, in the community of faith, not here either, or downtown, or at King Supers. It's not easy, but it is, it is possible. And we need to enter into it with all the generosity and hospitality and need for forgiveness and change that we can muster. Because you are everyone's eternal companion. And we can be everyone's hospitable neighbor. So guide us, protect us, be our courage and our strength, and certainly our love. To the nearest, dearest person in our life. And then to someone who's really different and has just immigrated in to our lives. That happens. It will fill us with wonder and spirit and joy and some new beginnings.
remove our fears, enhance our love, and bless, as we've done this morning, all the children of the world, even those on our borders. We ask it in his name, and we thank you for this. He taught us how to pray about these things. Will you join me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.